Welcome to our special coverage of France's national tribute ceremony to Jacques Delors, who died in December at the age of 98. This is taking place at Les Invalides in Paris. Delors credited as being the architect of the modern European Union. He served three terms as the European Commission president, longer than anyone else. Delors, a socialist, helped create the single market, allowing the free movement of people. He laid the groundwork for the common currency, the euro, and during his tenure, also saw the creation of the Schengen Agreement for Travel and the Erasmus Program for Student Exchanges. Over the next 45 minutes, we'll be speaking to our guests and correspondents, taking a closer look at the man that was celebrated in Brussels, Paris, and Berlin, but also reviled in London. But first, Catherine Norris Trent tells us what to expect from Les Invalides. The national homage to Jacques Delors is set to be a solemn, formal ceremony, as these occasions always are. It's being held at the Hôtel des Invalides here on the left bank of Paris. This is a military headquarters, an army museum, and the tomb of Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, and it's where great figures in French life receive these formal homages after their deaths. So French President Emmanuel Macron we will be presiding over the ceremony. He will review the troops. There'll be a military band and choir performing the French national anthem La Marseillaise. Emmanuel Macron uh, will deliver a formal tribute, a speech to Jacques Delors. So that a look at the way things will unroll here in Paris. Uh, let's speak to our Berlin correspondent, though, Nick Spicer, a man that interviewed Jacques Delors back in 1999. Hello to you. Uh, Nick, um, Delora, uh, certainly a towering figure here in Europe. Uh, when you spoke to him, what were your main takeaways? Well, I was terrified. I was in my 20s and studying politics, and he was a hero to many of my fellow students who are studying the European Union. I remember a man of a formidable intellect, uh, of great humility and a wry sense of humor. I asked him, this was just days before the actual launch of the Euro on January 1st, 1999, uh, how he was going to feel as the man who's recognized as the architect of, of the single currency in Europe. And he didn't talk about himself. He talked about the teamwork that made it all happen. And then he also talked uh, about the need to continue the political building of Europe. There has to be more solidarity. Let's remember he was a socialist. Uh, there has to be cooperation uh, between people. So uh, also a man who would actually answer the question you asked him. He could answer questions on an absolutely anything, it seemed. Uh, we also asked him about uh, a colleague of mine, jokingly, what about unifying the soccer teams in Europe? And he said, well, that would be impossible uh, with a twinkle in his eye, and then set out a plan to actually do it. So my takeaway from him was really of a man who took himself seriously, took the job that he had to take on seriously, um, but was capable of great humility and great compassion. He always talked about the need while liberalizing Europe, while creating this common currency to make sure that there weren't any people left behind, any countries left behind. And, and Nick, uh, football aside, were your takeaways shared by the, uh, the people in Germany? Germany's government, was he viewed as fondly by them? He's been widely praised in the press. I mean, at his passing, uh, he is seen as the Frenchman, even though he was representing Europe at the time, who really took steps to dispel the traditional German fears of a resurgent and reunified Germany when the wall fell. Three days after the wall fell, he was in Berlin speaking on German TV, saying, ich habe keine Angst, I am not afraid of a reunified Germany. And of course, he laid the groundwork for the Euro, which was built really on the Deutschmark, Germany had a sort of monetary hegemony in Europe, and that was a way of anchoring Germany politically within the larger European ensemble. And many people have said that German reunification and the creation of the euro are two sides of the same coin. So he is lauded in Germany for that. There were some things that Germans didn't like over the years. For instance, um, he was seen as not pushing hard enough for free trade, but that came from the German Federation of Industry, um, which is not really surprising. He had a big, big 
defender in Helmut Kohl, of course, the German chancellor who oversaw reunification, who with then French president Francois Mitterrand initially put him forward as a candidate for the European Commission for his first tenure. All right, Nick, we'll be speaking to you later in the day. Nick Spicer speaking to us from Berlin. Let's go to London. Benedict Pavio probably giving us a different uh, portrait of Jacques Delors. Hello to you, uh, Benedict. Uh, Delors, not seen as fondly in London, whether by the government or the media. Indeed, he became somewhat of a, a hate uh, figure. He was perceived uh, by Margaret Thatcher, by John Major, her successor, uh, as wanting to take away powers uh, and the so sovereignty of the United Kingdom uh, to Brussels. Um, hence the reason, for example, of the two-fingered salute by the famous British tabloid The Sun, up yours, Delors. Um, and uh, that was a very consistent theme very much. Although Margaret Thatcher, the prime minister, was in favor uh, of a single market, she did not share his what she called his federalist uh, vision. Uh, so very harsh criticism um, in his lifetime. And when he was EU commission uh, president, we could somewhere say that this was a, a precursor of the whole British uh, stance within the then EEC, the European Economic Community, the common market as it was originally, uh, and then the EU. And of course, in his lifetime, he lived to see uh, the exit of the United Kingdom, that Brexit uh, that came and that was voted for marginally, but voted for by the British people in 2016. Indeed. All right, Benedict, thank you very much. We'll be speaking to you again later in the program as well. Benedict Pavio in London. Um, let's get some analysis now and speak to Andrew Smith, a historian in modern France at Queen Mary uh, University of London. Hello to you, Andrew. Um, Benedict was just mentioning uh, Brexit. One of Delors' uh, major concerns was that at a certain point, maybe three, maybe five members would leave the EU and try to quit the common project and go their own way. And if they did, that would be the beginning of the end of the, the common project. Um, how do you think he'd view today's EU? Well, I think it would be a, a challenge, certainly. Um, we know that, uh, of course, we saw Europe as being incomplete. Uh, it was an ongoing project, had not reached its goal. Um, it was something that, that needed to continue to be kind of uh, safeguarded, really, um, by the political class, but also to kind of grow the idea of an attachment to Europe. Um, of course, uh, we know that he spoke a lot about this idea of a social Europe, about having people believe in it, you know. Um, way back in 2013, uh, he gave a speech in Paris in which he identified, you know, three key dangers uh, for the Euro contemporary European Union. And I think, honestly, even, you know, what is now 10, 11 years later, um, that we would see many of the same issues. He spoke about, you know, the idea of the economic and social slump, which had you know, such tragic consequences for so many people, about the, um, the worrying image of a Europe which was punitive and somehow removed from ordinary citizens, but also the threat of populism, um, which he said fed on some of the, the kind of uh, the, the depredations of, of globalisation. So I think actually those three things, if we see them, could almost be written today. And we can see that there are ongoing issues to be resolved. And I think very clearly a call that Delors echoed in his later years for young people to take the initiative, seize it and create this social idea of Europe. Uh, Andrew, another question, though. He was also concerned about enlargement, worried that um, the EU could come under strain. How do you think he'd feel about Ukraine's potential uh, membership? Well, I think quite importantly, he uh, he focused on the idea that Europe should be driven by all its member states um, and not simply represent the kind of wishes of a, of a small coterie who would impose it on others. Um, so I think it would very much be something which looked at this idea of a, a grand project, a spirit of Europe, an idea of drawing things together. Um, he said, of course, you know, quite famously, he talked about the idea that you needed to have a heart and a screwdriver not just to be a technocrat and focus on those committee room decisions, but to be driven by a grand vision of what Europe can be. I think the idea that Ukraine might aspire to a certain vision of European values, of European kind of practices, of a, a social vision of Europe would be something that he would look to sponsor within the confines of what is possible within the European Union framework. All right. Thank you, Andrew. We'll be speaking to you again as well. Let's talk to Quentin Peel from Chatham House, an associate fellow of the Europe program. Hello to you, oh, Quentin. This sort of grand vision of what Europe can be, do you think um, 
that Europe still exists? I think I think it does, uh, and uh, I think that uh, a lot of what is in Europe today bears very much the imprint of Jacques Delors. Having said which, it is a much <coughs> larger and wider Europe than he was operating in. And I think challenges are far greater. After all, a war on Europe's borders was the one thing that he did not have to deal with. So I think it's a different Europe. And, and Quinn, do you think that perhaps the British public's view of, of Jacques Delors may have changed since Brexit? Well, I think that uh, this was never an entire British view. Uh, the view that Benedict described very well was very much the view of the nationalist right, the right wing of the Conservative Party, who never really understood Jacques Delors. He actually made enormous efforts to embrace the British population, it was his inspiration to create the single European market as well as the single currency, and that was very much meant to bind in the British people. In the end, however, it fell foul of the divisions within British politics and the deep, deep division that still exists in the country today about whether Britain should be part of Europe or outside Europe. And those deep divisions, we've seen this growing polarization, whether it's in Britain or here in France or, or next door in Germany. Um, this term we saw with a lot of the obituaries that were written in late December for Jacques Delors, a, a statesman, a brilliant statesman. That's one that we see often in today's media after someone passes away. But we don't talk about people in glowing terms because of this glowing, uh, this growing uh, polarization. Uh, polarization uh, while they're still active, do you think that's a term that's being used perhaps carelessly, or is it the fault of journalists like myself that perhaps don't uh, uh, distribute this term um, more often? I think Jacques Delors was a great statesman. He wasn't, though, a, a really fingertips politician. He was much more, I think, what one would call a, a political uh, manipulator. He, he, he wasn't comfortable in the world of popular politics. He was very good at the politics of the smoke-filled rooms, if you like, of, of persuading leaders of other governments to actually back him and go along with his ideas. So um, he was a statesman in a different way. I don't think he would relate at all to the world of populist politics that one sees today with the likes of Donald Trump or, or Boris Johnson in Britain, or indeed people I can see there attending the homage in Paris like Viktor Orban. Indeed. Uh, Quinn, stay with us. Uh, just a reminder, we are uh, having special coverage here on France 24, uh, this national tribute ceremony for Jacques Delors. We're awaiting uh, French President Emmanuel Macron uh, to offer a eulogy to uh, Delors. On the set with me is our international affairs commentator, Douglas Herbert. Hello to you, uh, Doug. Quinn, just saying there, um, Delors would not see eye to eye with a populist, to say the least. Uh, one of them, uh, quite notable, in attendance, uh, Hungary's uh, Viktor Orban. Yeah, it's interesting. It, it's a testimony to sort of how much Europe has become, in a sense, polarized, with a lot of the member states now hunkered down in their own um, corners ideologically. You know, if you want to talk about Delors himself and his, and his legacy, you know, just think when he became the European Union's essentially its executive, right, the, the head of the European Commission back in the mid-80s, 1985, there were 10 members of the EU, 10. Uh, today, count them, 27 members of the EU. The numbers speak for themselves. Now, and of those members, you know, we use the, we were speaking earlier about he's not only sort of the chief architect of a more unified Europe, but he was also considered, and he is the father of Europe's common currency, the euro. How many of those 27 countries today use the euro? 20 of them. 20. That's uh, nothing to sneeze at. It's 350 million people. So this is a man who comes by his legacy. And you were talking before about statesmen and does he, you know, using the uh, the honorifics, great statesmen, elder statesmen. Yeah, he comes by it very honestly. Let's not forget, Delors was born in the mid-20s, right? This is a man whose father fought in World War One. 
Delors himself witnessing the devastation, the atrocities of World War II. In this sense, his life was a crash course in the reasons the European Union came about in, in, in the first place. This sense of never again should Europe be ravished and devastated by these great wars, uh, horrible wars of the 20th century. He saw it. He internalized it. It was part of his living, breathing life and his biography. And, and this is why he became such a devout, almost religiously devout. He was a religious Catholic, but an almost religiously devout proponent of this more federal, a more communal Europe, a more unified Europe, a Europe of the, of the people, sovereign in a federalist sort of block. Yeah, and Doug, just as you're speaking, we have the French President Emmanuel Macron at the uh, courtyard of Les Invalides, next behind him, hey. the Prime Minister. Elizabeth Bourne. He's just arriving on this day of national tribute to Jacques Delors. We're expecting the last post to be played by the Bugle momentarily. Um, Doug, until then, you mentioned that the timing. Yeah. Or, you know what? Let's just let's just listen into this now at the moment. Well, we heard the uh, last post uh, played by the Bugle. That's a tribute to the dead. Then it was followed by the France's national anthem, La Marseillaise. Um, Doug, um, French President Emmanuel Macron to make a, a deliver eulogy momentarily. Uh, you talked about the significance of the timing of this ceremony. What did you mean? It comes at a significant sort of juncture for Europe, you know, uh, philosophically, politically, obviously. We have European elections uh, beckoning uh, on the horizon in June, elections at which uh, a lot of political observers uh, see the far right making very big inroads, uh, very significant inroads, um, and uh, with, with potential consequences for uh, Europe's future in terms of Jacques Delors' vision of integration. I think that what Emmanuel Macron is trying to do, and I'm not saying he's trying to politicize them at the moment. Uh, this is, you know, obviously a ceremony, a tribute to, to Jacques Delors. But I do think he wants this moment to, to showcase, in a sense, in a positive way, Jacques Delors' unifying legacy at a time of, as we've been speaking about, polarization. I think he wants to seize on this to sort of breathe new life um, into that European idea, or at least a sort of reminder to Europeans of, of Jacques Delors' legacy and why it is more important than ever today at a time when perhaps uh, some uh, elements in Europe, in some corners of Europe, uh, you know, are not exactly proponents of a more unified Europe, just the opposite, populist forces, centrifugal forces pulling uh, away at Europe, trying to grapple back, wrest back more sovereignty for national governments as opposed to federal governments. I think that uh, Emmanuel Macron, who has always been an extremely 
pro-European, perhaps the most pro-European of European leaders of the moment, um, he is definitely going to use uh, to use this to perhaps as a little bit of rocket fuel uh, to to showcase uh, the positive things that Europe can do and the positive things that Europe has done. Manu Macron just reviewing the troops here. Um, were Macron's interest in a more cohesive, a closer integrated Europe, possibly a European defense force. Would those have been consistent with the Jacques Delors vision? You know, you, we could argue all day about how large a European Union Jacques Delors would have wanted. Um, you know, one thing about is he wanted more a more integrated and a more unified Europe, but he also wanted a Europe that would be cohesive and would work. Um, so he probably would not have been a promo proponent of just letting everyone into Europe. There are right now a lot of candidates waiting at the uh, at the doors as candidate members to get in. Just just to cut you off, Doug, I just want to step in. I believe uh, Emmanuel Macron paying his respects to Martine. Aubry, the daughter of Jacques Delors, the current mayor of Lille, and the former head of the uh, Socialist Party in France. A number of large figures in attendance, uh, we're, uh, former French presidents, former French prime ministers, as well as European officials and other heads of state. Um, Doug, sorry. Yeah, Ma Martine Aubry, interesting. Yeah, daughter of Jacques Delors. She has uh, reportedly been, you know, very closely and intimately involved in the planning of this ceremony, you know, corralling together uh, all of the sort of European figureheads, past and present, um, who, you know, upholders, if you will, and guardians of Jacques Delors' memory and legacy. Um, however, it's, it's believed that she was not, as she agreed, you know, not to have a prominent speaking role. And perhaps that is because, you know, she has been in France, uh, a politician. Uh, we were talking about polarization before. Um, some of her views in some quarters of France are controversial. And perhaps having her speak at this event would have been seen as politicizing the event in, in a certain way. But um, whatever the case, she's been involved in the organization. She won't be speaking. But you really do see there, uh, you know, it's the who's who of, of European leaders past and present and even the beginning. You know, you see Emmanuel Macron as prime minister walking out. The members of the government are all there. You have uh, several uh, European uh, leaders, present European leaders, the president of Portugal, the German president, Frank Walter Steinmeier is there, uh, the Hungarian. We mentioned Viktor Orban, who's been always uh, often a dissenting voice uh, in the European Union, to, to put it mildly. Uh, the Croatian prime minister, Belgium's prime minister, Alexander de Croix is there, uh, Luxembourg, uh, the, the Dutch prime minister, uh, Mark Rutte, they're all all there right now, um, and uh, they are there really a tribute to, to a man, uh, many of them, uh, some of them were perhaps too young to really uh, see his, his, his rise early in his career when he was first in the government of and, François and Mitterrand. But, the but significance of Les Invalides, for viewers that might not be familiar with it, as we see the flag draped coffin making its way out. How significant is it that this ceremony is taking place at Les Invalides? It's very significant. Les Invalides is the ultimate honor uh, in France, uh, you know, the burial place uh, burial place of Napoleon. And we heard Benedict Pavio in London telling us before, you know, the, the significance uh, of, of that backdrop. It's really reserved only for, uh, you know, the highest uh, figureheads of, of the French uh, Republic, past and present. Uh, and this honor is really also a way for France, uh, Jacques Delors, not just a European figure, of course, but also very much a, pre a French, a Gallic uh, personality. And yes, a Gallic personality who, because he was French, and often was seen as consummately, quintessentially Gallic, a heavy French accent embodying uh, French ideals and even some would say French arrogance, even though Jacques Delors himself uh, would have bridled at that description. He was from sort of almost a poor urban background, born into a working class family. Um, but this is very much, yes, also France claiming Jacques Delors as one of their own. He's a European but he's also a Frenchman, a proud Frenchman with a proud legacy. Well, let's listen in as his flag draped coffin makes its way into the Les Invalides uh, courtyard.
Jacques Delors' coffin being laid on the ground at Envalide uh, military uh, site here in Paris. Um, I want to speak to uh, Andrew Smith, uh, a historian in London. Um, Andrew, if you've been following along, Doug was just talking to us about um, some of the guests that were in attendance uh, at at this ceremony today in in France, and, and we have high-ranking European officials as well as uh, figures from national governments. Um, one biography had called Delors, um, uh, called the EU, the house that Jacques built. Is that hyperbole? Well, I think if uh, Jean Monnet laid the foundations of Europe's structure, then Delors certainly tried to breathe life into them and to create the idea of a European spirit. Um, and I think many people now look at him as being sort of uh, an aspirational figure for many of today's political leaders. Um, he, he trod that line between technocrats and between demagoguery, which was seen plague European politics. Um, of course, he created uh, European structures that protected uh, a vision of peace, but a positive vision of peace. Not a Europe that was a fortress, but a Europe that protected her citizens. The idea was that if Europe could speak more loudly in concert, it would always still have its national accents. It would have those voices and um, which would allow Europe to represent its you know, unique personalities within that context. And yeah. I think today's ceremony is... is and we're just going to cut you off. Uh, the French president at the microphone now delivering a eulogy of Jacques Delors. Let's listen in. On the 27th of December last year, that was the end of his path, his journey the journey of life that never um, at any turn of the century um, played up what was expected. Yes, his life was always going on different paths, away from the main road, uncovering new visions, working with his companions, a life of journeys and curves that can be found in the streets of many montants on those lands of Paris and Corrèze in Paris, in places where decisions were made in Clichy, in Brussels, so many capitals of our Europe, and Paris and the Saint-Jacques Street. Those paths laid down a journey of republican meritocracy. His grandparents were peasants. His mother made a hat. His father worked at the Bank of France. And he learned from them to make efforts. He went on these journeys. And those acted as a, what acted as a compass was his faith opening himself uh, to others, uh, having a liking for duty before a liking for power. And those strong words of from his father, who was mutilated during the First War, and who said, we have to reconcile. So from the Massif Central to the European Parliament, Jacques Delors, never tired of exploring in order for people to reconcile. He was a light ahead of his time. He would uh, find alternatives. He would build bridges, always going to that immutable horizon that was more than anything else for him, human dignity. That was his deep conviction, uh, fed by Catholic thinking, from Emmanuel Mounier, between the dictatorship of masses and the imperialism of individualism, there's another way. That of the human person, with its uh, freedom to commit and its responsibility to society. There is a way, a humanist way for Europe, and that's what he chose. His fight first was to reconcile with itself a society that was blocked through trade unions, CFTC, CFDT. Politics was not important, was not among his youth passions. The prognosis of the Tour de France, um, basketball games, jazz... 
and God. Yes, those were his main interests, but not politics. When he was a teenager, he thought of cinema, of journalism, and political leaders were seen as uh, responsible for the defeat of 1940 for the defeat of the French people on um, fleeing on, high, on way, on roads. But fate was otherwise. He could reconcile. He was capable and he became a decision maker. And increasingly, he went further up in the back of France. He um, also worked within its trade union. And at night, after working at the bank, he would open up his books and study the um, theories of uh, economists and uh, fighting his way through competitions. He went to the uh, Social and Economic Council, and Eric Massé was attracted by him and uh, hired him. And he went on reconciling his uh, aspirations as a leftist and also as a Gaullist who wanted to plump for regeneration. He was selected in 1969 by Chaban Delmas rather than a plumping for a left that seemed to be defeated for a long time. He wanted a new society. He was the first social advisor at Matignon. That's where he found how he could develop his thinking to modernize society, to place justice within labor, to develop a contractual um, policy based on uh, collective agreements so that those who didn't have the opportunity to learn could keep on learning during their life and participate in the first line of lifelong education always bent on reconciling, conciliation, reconciling the French with work to show them that it was a way to emancipation, knowledge, lifelong training, so that everyday working should not be slavery, should not be just a, a physical work, but also a way to go further up to reconcile even further. He joined the Socialist Party in 1974 in the, at that time of opening, and then he plumped for the social market economy to um, aim for an alternative. Ten years on, in he also went away from a clannish fight with uh, others. He wanted to uh, bring his own Christian blood to the impetus of 1974 and further reform. Jacques Delors did not believe in the so-called great knights. He believed in passions in negotiations every day, in social dialogue, beyond political opposition. And then in 1981, that was when his camp won, when there was a strong impetus and also a strong economic, economic upheavals, when the franc was devalued on two occasions. He became the Ministry for Economy and Finance, and he was holding firm, and he launched efficient anti-inflation policies. He went along with the major nationalizations, with the budgetary rigor. And the next year, he lost his beloved son, journalist Jean-Paul Delors. That was a frightening um, tragedy, but he faced up to it. And with his wife, he had the proper companion. And then he was proud of Martine, his uh, daughter. And then Clémentine, his granddaughter, was a joy. And he found the strength to hold up. On the next week, he was back within the Council of Ministers. 
He was devastated, but he was still present, always present. Because at the time, they were, those were difficult times for France. The War of Two Roses divided the Socialist Party, and the country hesitated between two journeys. And after the 30 years of growth, skeptics wanted Mitterrand to move away from constraints, and people would um, come at night to predict uh, untoward the fate to the Republic. But he was there again, hand in hand with Pierre Mauroy. He fought like a lion with others to defend his European vision of economy, to uh, prove doomsayers wrong and to keep France within the common project. That was one of his major works of reconciliation, 1983, where at that decisive time, he wanted to reconcile government socialism with the social market economy, to reconcile France with Europe. He, to make possible the European ideals without yielding anything, to keep with realities. In 1985, the president of the Economic Commission was vacant. There was a vacancy, and his candidacy, when he was a mayor of Clichy, and he was building on the strength of a European MP, he um, ran for the presidency. So many decades after the Great War, he was the, the First World War. And he was the son of a foot soldier, and he had um, the possibility to control the fate of Europe. And he wanted um, the past to be recognized, and he wanted the future to be um, a potential promise, to re a reconciliation of peoples, so that no life be... Um, uh, done away by the blinded blindness of people. He wanted the Europe to reconcile with its future. The current face of Europe is, was contributed to by Jacques Delors, feature per feature, with the constant support of Mitterrand and Kohl for several decades. In this Europe, he said, this Europe belongs to us as much as we belong to her, and we have to keep the fight. This is a legacy where, for the last 30 years, um, the three, his three institutes uh, watched um, the freeing of uh, people and goods, the single market with all the players of civil society, the Europe of social dialogue, reconciliation of unions and um, employers, monetary union, euro, the central a European Bank, the Europe of uh, growth and solidarity that would leave no one behind, uh, supporting um, unprivileged regions with uh, subsidies, a Europe which is aware of the need to broaden and to deepen, um, that sees um, the way forward as um, a, a string of agreements, a Europe that needs to reform in order to be still free in its action, a Europe that sees um, economic, social and environmental duties as a um, responsibility for sovereignty and also a philosophical um, unity, the Erasmus program, which he made, so that the youth of Europe could meet each other and understand each other and find a way forward. A united Europe in diversity, reunited Europe, doing away with the um, Iron Curtain, welcoming the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, and B Baltic Europe. Rarement. It is not often that our Europe has made so much progress. And with his teams and his companions, several leaders attending today can pay tribute to him. And 
We know also that several European leaders were kind enough to come today, and I'd like to thank them for this. And with them, he made uh, a lot of progress for our continent. During those years, he was all over the place. He would find um, resources to come and see uh, every member state. He traveled 180 times a year, and he would find compromises and necessary agreements. He was a leader among leaders, the eighth member of the G7, and he was the conscience of those leaders. He was always modern in that trifecta, uh, competition, solidarity, and cooperation in order to strengthen Europe, a more sovereign, more united and stronger Europe. Thanks to him, Europe has an identity. Jacques Delors never was president of the French Republic. On the 11th of December 1994, he said no to uh, running for president of, the, of France. He looked at uh, the he looked at the Frenchmen in the eyes, who were people who were expecting him. But in his words, in his silence, we knew uh, how he had been wounded and how he was always faithful to his ideals. And um, the future of the community was always foremost. And once again, his sense of duty led him astray from what was expected of him. And the sense of uh, doing his duty which can be found in the Ode to Joy, uh, the European anthem, this feeling of uh, duty well accomplished, that was always in the forefront of his thought and his behavior. Several months on, in his office in Brussels, those hands that shaped Europe wrote history, signed decisive treaties, and brought people together, those hands have closed his files and um, restored order. Carefully, as he did everything, he brought those familiar things together. A few um, examples, a few copies of L'Equipe's uh, um, daily reading, a lamp, a Medal of Honor, one of the memories of the uh, ha harshest strikes he uh, participated in, the um, poster of S Citizen Kane, and a photograph of one of his friends. All of this, he brought it with himself wherever he went. But he left behind something bigger, that cannot be moved, that is intangible, a French imprint and a European imprint, the potential for a social democracy of liberation, the possibility of a united Europe, Schengen Europe, Erasmus, Maastricht Europe, uh, brought together by common values from Compostela to Balkans, from uh, all over Europe and the strength to change hope into history. I made a mistake. On the 27th of December last year, his journey was not brought to an end. No, Jacques Delors just gave us a relay for m many of you have taken up the slack and you are fighting at the top of our European institutions, at the top of your government, your states, of your countries. This journey, his journey, will go on. It is a difficult journey. It is a journey on peaks, away from the road of facility, always in, in sense of imbalance and 
Economic strength and social justice are brought together. There's a sense of balance between reality and ideals, a reconciliation between the two. That was the unquiet path of that great Frenchman. That's what he followed, that honest European man, Jacques Delors. Long live Europe. Long live the Republic. Long live France. French President Emmanuel Macron paying homage to Jacques Delors, who passed away in late December at the age of 98. He served three times as European Commission President, longer than anyone else. Emmanuel Macron said he reconciled Europe with its future, and thanks to Jacques Delors, Europe has its identity, that the journey Jacques Delors began continues. Détachement interarmé. Garde à vous. Présenté. Arme. Au mort. Well, we've had the last post-bugle salute to Jacques Delors. That was followed by a minute of silence well, and then was France's was national anthem, La Marseillaise. We're now expecting Beethoven's Ode to Joy, which is the wow. EU's anthem to play. Yeah,
And I'd like to go back to Andrew Smith, who I cut off just before the French president began his eulogy. Uh, hello to you once again, Andrew. Um, during Emmanuel Macron's eulogy, we heard uh, a long list of uh, Jacques Delors' uh, life, his accomplishments, uh, what he did for Europe, for France. Um, just curious, from your perspective, were there any sort of near misses uh, that Jacques Delors had, perhaps things that um, he didn't accomplish that, that he fought desperately hard for? Well, I think the, the key phrase from Emmanuel Macron's eulogy was this idea of reconciliation. Um, and that's something he wanted to continuously pursue, I think, in his vision for Europe. I mentioned a, a Europe into which he, you know, breathed life into those those foundations, those structures. But it was a Europe which aspired alongside breathing. I think that's really what he was trying to do for much of his life. Um, he, he did want to kind of, you know, really embed that idea of a social Europe. Perhaps didn't succeed fully. Um, it was this idea of a socially embedded capitalism, one which allowed Europe to defend itself, to draw its citizens in towards it, and to let them fall in love with the project. Um, I think it's as much a testament to see those European leaders uh, standing and paying tribute to Jacques Delors as it is to understand that those 100 European Erasmus students are there at the same time. And that's I, why right now we're hearing that anthem. Yeah, yeah, stay on that thought. We're going to listen into Ode to Joy now, just beginning. Beethoven's Ode de Joy, the EU anthem playing there. Andrew, uh, cut you off again. I'm making a, a habit of that. Um, you were talking about some of um, perhaps the EU not fully achieving the social vision that Jacques Delors had. Uh, might he have considered to run for president in France to maybe push this agenda further? We heard in Emmanuel Macron's eulogy um, that, uh, of course, it was in, in 1994, he was sort of envisioned almost as a, a challenger uh, to, to Jacques Chirac in that, that presidential campaign, um, but he refused to stand. He was someone, um, as one of your previous commentators mentioned, much more at home in the committee room than you know, issuing sort of thunderous announcements from uh, the, the rostrum. He was someone whose vision was for politics as a project with a vision, but also with a certain pragmatism. I and mean, I think that's represented today as a challenging legacy for the left in France. We can see that very much in the way that Emmanuel Macron is drawing that kind of emphasis on reconciliation, on that politics which bridges social democracy and Christian democracy into meeting these ideas of a more sovereign Europe ready to meet those kind of supranational challenges. Yeah, um, I also want to speak to Quentin Peel um, from Chatham House. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Quentin, um, we heard Emmanuel Macron uh, talk about uh, Jacques Delors' life, um, him witnessing the, the horrors of Nazism firsthand. How do you think uh, those experiences impacted his work? Oh, I think hugely. I think he was always very conscious that reconciliation was at the heart of the European project. But he was a pragmatist who therefore was very conscious of how you had to build a Europe that was popular with its peoples. He wasn't an elitist at all. Um, he was very much behind uh, also the regional policy of Europe, that you had to plow money into the poorer regions, whether it was the south of France or the north of, of, of Britain uh, or the east of Germany, that you really had to get 
ordinary people to believe in the project. And all that, I think, went back to his memories uh, and links to the terrible wars of the 20th century that had divided Europe. We now see the pallbearers lifting the coffin of Jacques Delors in the courtyard of Les Invalides. Uh, this is a national tribute uh, taking place to the towering figure Jacques Delors, who passed away at the age of 98 in late December. Um, I want to speak to our correspondent in Berlin, Nick Spicer. Uh, hello to you again, uh, Nick. Um, we're discussing how uh, Jacques Delors' first-hand experiences impacted his uh, work. Uh, when you spoke to him, what were your main takeaways about his, his vision and the future of Europe? And do you think he'd be concerned about where it is today? I think he's expressed, he expressed concerns about the direction of Europe even when he was in retirement, uh, commenting on this or that leader. But I'd like to leave you with a, a quote he was fond of, of making of Antonio Gramsci, an Italian Marxist. Uh, and he said, this is how I like to think. You have to be a pessimist of the intellect, but an optimist of the will. And I think that essentially when I spoke to him, I got the impression that he was a man who would face huge challenges and through hard work and I've, I've known people who have worked with him at his foundation and uh, there wasn't really a work uh, you know play balance it was all work his his life was his work and he was committed to to Europe to bringing people together and as some of the um, previous speakers have been saying it wasn't just about the financial stuff about creating the common currency in the single European market uh, in 1986 which was a way of bringing the Brits on board but also keeping in mind that you hadn't it was impossible to leave people behind you had to have those co cohesion funds for the regions which uh, needed economic lifting you had to have lifelong training for workers a reflection of his background Background in, in Christian unionism and so his vision went beyond just the political and economic it was really a humanistic one one about how do we make people's lives better how do we bring out all of the best in, in every human being in, in, in Europe I'll just leave one, you with one other idea um, it's, it's hard to cast our minds back to uh, the early 90s when there was the Oslo Peace Accord, but Shimon Peres, who is the Israeli Prime Minister, actually wrote a book about the New Middle East. It'll seem impossible now, but he was citing the Europe that Jack Delors had built as a potential example for reconciliation in the Middle East. All right, Nick, thank you very much. Uh, Nick Spicer reporting from Berlin. Uh, Quentin, uh, some of the things that Nick was saying, a uh, pessimist about the intellect, an uh, uh, optimist about the will of the people. Um, it's hard to look at um, perhaps someone's legacy in the EU when so much of it can be sort of bogged down by the details or by the bureaucracy, but the values that built these institutions are very important. And in today's society, it's important to remember why they came about, when they came about, and, and the broader context, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And I think that it's precisely that thought that Europe could be a model for many other parts of the world um, was also an extraordinary one. So whether it's the Middle East or Latin America or indeed parts of Asia, that the, that the way in which Europe tried to create a balance between the nation state and a much more integrated federal institution, I think that that will remain with us as a great potential for the future, even as the world that we see today is riven by terrorism conflict. Indeed. Uh, thank you, uh, Quentin. Uh, let's speak to our correspondent in London, Benedict Pavio. Hello to you again, uh, Benedict. We were talking off air earlier about Jacques Delors' uh, legacy, and you mentioned to me that you thought perhaps he and his, his vision were perhaps misunderstood by at least some of the British public. Yes, being half French, half British myself, I've had ample opportunity professionally and personally to really talk off air, obviously in real life, to uh, people and their vision of Europe. And often the British uh, here, uh, the English particularly, uh, say we're going to Europe which uh, I remind them that you're not going to Europe, you are in Europe, you're going to continental Europe. And really uh, that other saying, fog in channel, continent isolated. So very often there seems to be some lack of appreciation, 
understanding, comprehension, and a genuine one, uh, it's a historical one, of not fully appreciating, evaluating, I think, the, the French, the Spanish, the Italian, the German uh, desire um, almost in the DNA for peace and how that was um, so fundamental to the creation uh, of the common market, of the EC, of the European Union. Uh, and I think that is something that also participated in that feeling. It was not the biggest factor, but of Brexit. And it's interesting when I look at Jacques Delors and uh, just days before the Brexit referendum in 2016, there was a rumor that he wanted Britain to leave so that other member states could accelerate their process of integration. But he actually said, I consider the UK's participation in the European Union to be a positive element, both for the British and for the Union. Well, we know that the British people decided by a narrow margin, margin to leave the EU, who knows what will happen in the future? Uh, and certainly there is a bigger rapprochement uh, under Rishi Sunak with France again. Um, and actually, very often, I think the British press overplay uh, the differences, whether it's between the UK and France or the rest of Europe. Uh, basically, whether it's um, in, at the UN uh, or in many other fields, NATO, etc., uh, the countries are very allied, share intelligence, uh, defence cooperation, etc. And that is where Jacques Delors played his part. Perhaps British history will be kinder to him and will vilify him less. And perhaps maybe one day the British media will also. All right, Benedict, thank you very much. Uh, Benedict Pavio reporting from London. Let's speak to Andrew Smith again. Andrew, uh, Benedict's parting shot about uh, the British media. Are you as hopeful that perhaps um, they might be more kind to uh, Jacques Delors or perhaps an idea of a, a more cohesive uh, EU? Um, what has the analysis been by the British press? I think uh, it has been uh, largely much more kind. Of course, there is always that emphasis on um, Margaret Thatcher's clash uh, with Jacques Delors, of course, her famous no, 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 she said to Delors and to federalism in the Commons. But that was really in response to that speech he gave in Bournemouth in uh, 1988, where he spoke about the idea of a social Europe. And, you know, famously, he said, and I think he was right, that no one falls in love with a common market. If anything, the problem in Britain and its engagement uh, with Europe has been this emphasis simply on the idea of the common market and not recognising, as Benedict said, of course, these ideas of shared values, shared histories and shared cooperation. Um, and I think much more in the, the eulogies and the tributes that we saw um, at the turn of the year, it recognised Delors really as a man of vision and a man who contributed to the security and peace of Europe, to that reconciliation that Emmanuel Macron mentioned. So perhaps there is, I think, an aspirational legacy for reconciliation, for finding ways to make politics work for people. All right, Andrew, thank you very much. Andrew Smith from Queen Mary University in London. Let's cross now to our reporter, Catherine Norris Trent, who attended the ceremony at Les Invalides. Uh, Catherine, we were following along as you were in attendance there, some notable faces in the crowds, a, a touching ceremony, and a long tribute by uh, French President Emmanuel Macron. What were your takeaways? Hi there, Will. Yes, it was a solemn ceremony, but with those personal touches highlighting, of course, not only Jacques Delors' European career there with that uh, homage at the end by current EU leaders, former EU bigwigs, some heads of state from EU countries, including uh, Viktor Orban of Hungary, who is not really espousing the vision of uh, EU unity. But nonetheless, they lined up behind his coffin as Ode to Joy, Beethoven's Ode to Joy was played there very much, bringing out uh, the legacy of Jacques Delors. And at the end, and perhaps you can still hear it behind me now, um, jazz songs are being played by the military band because he was a noted jazz fan, blaring it out at, at full volume at home. His daughter, Martine Aubry, who was herself a former government minister of the Socialist Party here, as she fondly remembered. So a formal ceremony, as is always the case here at Les Invalides for these national honours. So, of course, there was the review of the troops and the, the pomp and ceremony of this French state occasion, but we did get a glimpse of the man. And interestingly, you know, the, the, his clash with Margaret Thatcher and, and those things, they, they are remembered here in France, but that's not what people remember the most. They remember him as a great French 
British politician. They're proud of his European heritage, certainly that coming across in Emmanuel Macron's speech, but also the fact that he declined to run for the French presidency famously in 1994, the president who never was. And that was a, a real public moment here in France, a bit of political drama. And that's what a lot of French people remember him as most, I would say. All right, Catherine, thank you very much. Catherine Norris, Trent reporting from Les Invalides. We're going to speak to Quentin Peel again. Um, Quentin, uh, this is our special coverage of this national tribute uh, ceremony. So I'm going to give you the final thought of Jacques Delors. What would you like his legacy to be in terms of what people think of the most? Well, uh, wow. I think he was a great European above all else. He was a man who made Europe real. And I would dearly hope that at the end of uh, the end of my life, before the end of my life, the British will become reconciled to the vision of Europe that Jack Delors had, because that was very close to his heart. All right, Quentin, thank you very much. Uh, Quentin Peel from Chatham House, I'd like to thank him, as well as our other guests, Andrew Smith from Queen Mary University, Nick Spicer in Berlin, Benedict Pavio in London. That brings us to the end of this special coverage of a national tribute ceremony to Jacques Delors. Thank you for watching, and please stay tuned to France 24.